Our Father in Heaven, we praise you today for the gift of the Holy Spirit because we recognize that it is through the Holy Spirit that we can have the presence of Jesus in us and with us. Father, we come to you this morning asking that you would enlighten our thoughts and our minds Hide me behind you. We pray that Jesus would be seen and our hearts would be drawn after you. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we are continuing in our series from the book of Acts on the Holy Spirit. And I invite you to open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3.24. 1 John 3.24, this is near the book of Revelation, near the end of the Bible. 1 John 3.24, as we continue in our study on the Holy Spirit. 1 John chapter 3, verse 24. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him, and by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. How do we know that Jesus abides in us according to this text? It says, by the Spirit he has given us. In other words, even though Jesus is physically in heaven, through the agency of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is not only with us, Right now, he is always also in us. Amen? How many of you want Jesus in us? And Paul talks about Christ in me, the hope of glory. And have you ever wondered how that is possible? It is through the Holy Spirit. And as we go to our study guide this morning, oh, wow. Well, just pull out your study guide this morning and I guess we'll go... Fill in the blanks here. 1 John chapter 3, verse 24. And by this we know that He, Jesus, abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. There it is. The Holy Spirit brings the presence of Jesus into us. And so it is so essential for us to ask for the Holy Spirit. Amen? Because in asking for the Holy Spirit, we are really asking for the presence of Jesus to not only be with us, but to also be in us. Last week we mentioned in the book of Acts how there is this phrase that keeps coming up over and over again. And it says, wow, we're having all kinds of challenges this morning. Okay, let's kind of fake it here. I'll do this and we'll just kind of make it work anyways all right so in Acts chapter 2 verse 44 and they were all what does it say and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit we mentioned that this is a metaphor indicating that we all have the capacity to be filled with different spirits in the book of Acts you remember when Peter said to Ananias and Sapphira it was really to Sapphira when she lied about the money from the proceeds that they had received from the sale of this property, Peter said to Sapphira, why has Satan filled your heart? So we have the capacity and the potential of being filled with the spirit of Satan, heaven forbid, or being filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Bible uses this illustration of us being vessels, of being filled with different spirits. And the Bible uses this metaphor in the book of Acts of the Holy Spirit being poured out. It is as if the Holy Spirit is entering an individual and we are not just filled to a certain point, but we are filled to capacity. We are filled to the brim. We are filled to overflowing. And the power of the book of Acts was a group of people in the early church 
that were filled with the Holy Spirit, filled to capacity, and thereby they were filled with the presence of Jesus. And they went to change the world. In the book of Acts, it talks about the continuation of this experience. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then those who gladly received this word were baptized, and on that day about 3,000 souls were added to them, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking of bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. I want us to notice that even after the early church was filled with the Holy Spirit, there is something that they continued to do. You can see it here, that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And then it says, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple. In other words, in the book of Acts, it was not once filled always filled. It was filled and daily filled. There was a continuation of an experience that was to be daily, continual, repetitive. You see that the experience of the early church was not just at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down and the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit and they said, oh, okay, I guess we don't need to be filled again. But you see that the implication of the continuation of the early church was a repetition of daily implied filling. Repetitive. Continual. An experience that was not just once, but every single day. That's me. And after the running of the Chicago Marathon, and it was October 10, 2010. 10, 10, 10. That marathon will never happen again. And that is a forced smile, as you can see. 26.2 miles. There is nothing like it. I encourage you to do it at least once. And in Chicago, 40,000 insane people. There in the heart of Chicago... And you have to go by corrals. You go to a certain area. I'm not allowed with the Kenyans and the Ethiopians. They won't even let me in that corral. You have to qualify. And you're in a corral. And when the countdown happens and the Kenyans take off, you're walking to the start line. And it took me, because I was so far back of the Kenyans after they began, it took me 20 minutes to just get to the start line. And there is something about the psychology of a marathon. Because in the beginning, you're all high-fiving and smiling and just, woo, you know, just going through the streets and everyone's just pumped up and smiling and, and you're going through rah, rah, rah. People are on the sidelines. You feel like... Uh, 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 a superstar because the entire Chicago Marathon, there are literally thousands of people that are lining the streets, shouting in your face, and you are just there. Yes! And everyone is just jovial and happy and just elated. We are here at the Pantheon of running about mile 15. 
there is a gradual, if not sudden, change in the mood. It goes from elation to agony. And there's something bonding about 40,000 individuals experiencing corporate agony. The face droops to a, to a look of excruciation. And there's no smiles, no laughter, just si- silence. From mile 20 to mile 26. And when I ran my second marathon, because I wanted to have a PR, which is called a personal record. So I signed up for this thing. And there is a lot of literature about proper hydration. And they tell you that in preparation for a marathon, it is essential to drink water, but not only drink water, but to drink water properly. You don't just take a bunch of water and guzzle it because it flushes out everything. You take sips of water throughout the day for proper hydration. So I'm drinking all types of concoctions and electrolytes and water. The week prior, I am properly hydrating myself. And I got up to start the Detroit Marathon. And I was feeling so good passing people, just going for my personal record. I was so confident because I was hydrated. And then I began to skip water stations, which are every mile. And then I hit mile 20. And I hit what marathoners call hitting the wall. And without going into great detail, it was the most excruciating thing I've gone through as a person living a cushy life in a Western world. And I'll never forget the individuals that were there at mile 20. They said, only six more miles. And long story short, I finished the marathon My wife met me there, and I was so dehydrated that for the next probably six to eight hours, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. My friend actually that day had to go into the emergency tent and have an IV because he was so dehydrated. The temperature was low, so people thought that they didn't need to drink as much water. And looking back, I should have actually gone into that tent as well. See, the issue was I was filled, but I did not continue to be filled. I came to the marathon hydrated, but I needed to continue to stay hydrated for the duration of the race. And that is the important part of our Christian experience. We should not only be converted, but we need to continue to be converted every day. Go to, go to your study guide. You can see this in the... Oh, this is not in your study guide. Sorry, sleep deprivation. I meant to get this in. But Dwight L. Moody, many think that because they are filled once, that they are filled what? Forever. Oh, my friend. We are porous vessels. What does porous vessels mean? Which means that you are filled, but then you need to be filled again. Oh, my friend, we are porous vessels. It is necessary for us to constantly remain under the fountain in order to be full. The Christian experience is not just about being filled once. It is about the duration and the continuation and the repetition of continuing to be filled. Just like in the marathon, it's not just important to line up at the start line hydrated. We must continue to be hydrated for the duration of the race. Ellen White, this is in your study guide. To follow Jesus requires 
wholehearted conversion at the start and a repetition of this conversion, how much? Every day. So it's not only essential to be converted at the beginning, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, it is also essential to have that continuation every single day, to continue to be filled. And as D.L. Moody said, we are porous vessels. It is not once filled, always filled. You are filled, but only filled for today. When you wake up tomorrow, you need to be filled again. When you are getting ready to have a baby, I apologize for all these baby illustrations, but it is my experience right now. So you'll just have to just, just bear with me. Bear with me. When you're getting ready to have a baby, it's amazing how much the focus is on the birth. Rightfully so. We went to birthing classes, breathing exercises, all types of contraptions, these birthing balls and all kinds of literature, all focused on the birth. We even had an app that would do an analysis of the contractions. It was amazing. Just go through, click, beginning, end of contraction, all the analytics and everything. And so we were ready, we were focused, the contractions came and Long story short, the baby came. And I'll never forget when our son was born and he took his first breath. <sighs> wow, I will, I mean, just never forget it. I mean, life changing moment. He's born. His birthday. And then the daunting realization comes over our sleep-deprived consciousness that this baby requires continual, repetitive, <laughs> daily care. And literally, this baby needs Continual filling, literally, of milk every day. Not only every day, every few hours. Continual feeding. So much of the focus was on the birth, and rightfully so, it is Without birth, you don't have life. And so the birth is there. But then after the baby is born, the realization comes over our consciousness that this baby requires daily, continual, repetitive, seemingly ongoing, non-stop care and filling. Filling. Non-stop. Every single day. All right, I'll stop right there. You get the point. And in our Christian experience, the Bible tells us that we are born again. There is a metaphor of the Christian experience that is similar to being born. We are born, hallelujah, except Jesus, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. But, I would just say, I should say, uh, I should say and that is not the end even as a baby, requires daily continual filling, we are born again and every day, just as a baby needs to be filled in order to continue to live, we need daily care. Amen? Daily filling. This is the way that God has made it. It is not once filled Always filled. Oh, I wish that were so. That would be wonderful. Feed the baby once. He's set for life. Oh, whoa, population explosion, right? I mean, this is just amazing. But the way that God has created 
human beings at birth is daily, continual, repetitive care. And it's the same thing for the Christian. When we are born again, every day we need a daily provision. And that's why Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our what? Daily bread. And he's not just talking about physical food, friends. He's talking also about spiritual provision. And many times in our Christian experience, we stop after birth. No more feeding. I'm good. And we wonder as time goes on and our spiritual faculties begin to go into starvation mode and we go limp and lethargic lethargic and apathetic and we have lost our first love, we can many times trace it back to the reality that after being filled, we have stopped being continually filled. This is an an essential part of the Christian experience. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6 Yet the inward man, this is the spiritual nature, is being renewed day by day. Every day we are to be renewed. Go to the next one. How is the inner man renewed? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 through 17 and 19. He that would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. There's a lot in this text. But notice that it is through the Spirit that our inner man is renewed day by day. And it says that when the inner man is renewed through the Spirit, who dwells in us? Christ dwells in us through the Holy Spirit. So every single day, We need to continue to be filled. Every single day we need to wake up and say, Lord, fill me is my earnest plea. Moving on very quickly. Acts of the Apostles, page 56. To the consecrated follower of Jesus, there is wonderful consolation in the knowledge that even Christ, during his life on earth, sought his Father daily for fresh supplies of needed grace. Morning by morning, Jesus communicated with his Father in heaven, receiving from him daily a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, when he was on this earth, could have overcome or could have lived his life in his own strength, but as our example, he chose to depend on the Father for everything, and this he received, what? Daily. And the implication is, If Jesus received from the Father daily a provision of grace, what about Pastor Shin? Oh, wow. Sometimes I think I don't need it, but look, Jesus needed it. And Acts of the Apostles, page 50, for the daily baptism of the Holy Spirit, because the baptism of the Holy Spirit is really the presence of Jesus, every worker should offer his petition to God. Every day we should come to God and say, Lord, please fill me. Acts of the Apostles, page 284. As in the natural, so in the spiritual world. The natural life is preserved moment by moment by divine power, yet it is not sustained by a direct miracle. But through the use of blessings placed within our reach, so the spiritual life is sustained by the use of those means that providence has supplied. In other words, there is a correlation between daily sustenance physically and daily sustenance spiritually. You think about it, we are dependent creatures. Have you ever gone a day without eating? Anyone? Oh. I remember when I went three days without eating. 
and all I could think about was rice. Asian, anyway. And, I mean, this is the way we are. I felt weak. I mean, I know it's only three days, but I felt weak. I felt lethargic. I felt emaciated. Matter of fact, I've gone one day without eating, and after one day, I feel like I can't even think. I mean, think about how dependent we are. They, there's studies that have shown that when children miss breakfast, there is a dramatic decline in academic performance. Missing breakfast for children. Academic decline. And they say that if you continue to miss breakfast, I just read this study, children continuing to miss breakfast because of the nutritional deficiency, IQ can be lowered. Just from missing one meal a day. We are incredibly dependent individuals physically. And just as we take time to eat, that food is given to us by God. Zarabajah says that every piece of bread is stamped with the cross. So all that we eat, all that we drink is because of Jesus but that is provided for us and we need to take advantage of the provision. What this is saying is that we don't wake up in the morning and pray and say, Lord, give me a divine miracle. I need all of the nutrition injected into my bloodstream and I'm good. That's not how it works. We wake up in the morning and we say, Lord, thank you for this food and we eat it. In other words, we have to set aside time to be And we need to do this every day. And what this statement is saying is that there is a correlation between the physical and the spiritual. Even as in the physical, we need to eat every day. Spiritually, we need to be fed and filled every day. Have you ever wondered, I have, what we would look like if our physical bodies took on the condition of our spiritual condition. Would we be fit? Or would we look like we were in starvation for a month, for a week, for several days? There is a correlation between the physical and the spiritual world. In the midst of this maddening throng, God is speaking. He bids us come apart and commune with Him. Many, even in their seasons of devotion, fail of receiving the blessings of real communion with God. They are in too great haste. With hurried steps, they pass through the circle of Christ's loving presence, pausing perhaps a moment within the sacred precincts, but not waiting for counsel. They have no time to remain with the divine teacher. With their burdens, they return to their work. They must give themselves time to think, to pray, to wait upon God for a, listen to this, a renewal of physical, mental, and spiritual power. They need the uplifting influence of His Spirit. Receiving this, they will be quickened by fresh life. The wearied frame and the tired brain will be refreshed. The burdened heart will be lightened. Not a pause for a moment in His presence, but personal contact with Christ to sit down in companionship with Him. This is our need. Notice that this is transactional. We wake up in the morning tired, in need of strength. And this quotation seems to imply that in communion with God, not is it just spiritual refilling, but it is also physically rejuvenating. There have been times when I've woken up in the wee hours of the morning to pray and I'm absolutely exhausted. But after spending time with God, I am not only spiritually rejuvenated, but physically as well. Time with God. And we, by His grace, must take advantage of the provisions that He has given us 
to be filled daily. I think last year I mentioned this book, The Power of Habit. And there is something called a keystone habit. Oh, there we go. When people start habitually exercising, even as infrequently as once a week, they start changing other unrelated patterns in their lives, often unknowingly. Typically, people who exercise start eating better and becoming more productive at work. They smoke less and show more patience with colleagues and family. They use their credit cards less frequently and say they feel less stressed. It's not completely clear why, but for many people, exercise is a keystone habit that triggers widespread change. A keystone habit is a habit that has tentacles to other aspects of your life. You think you're just exercising, but exercise through studies have shown that an individual that goes out to even exercise once a week will exhibit other beneficial characteristics in other habits of their life. The book went on to talk about an individual that on a whim decided to exercise and her whole life and life's discipline was transformed through that simple decision of exercising. What is the keystone habit? One habit that alters every area of life. Keystone habits create a chain reaction, changing and rearranging your other habits as you integrate the habit into your life. And the thesis of this book was that rather than focusing on all these habits that we want to change, he said, look, the key is to Get the keystone habit. And through that keystone habit, all of the other habits can be affected. And my thesis this morning is that time with God, daily, repetitive, continual time with God, is a keystone habit. It is a keystone habit that will impact every other area of your life. Are you struggling in your marriage? Do you want to be a more loving and lovable husband or wife? Begin with the keystone habit of regular time with God. Amen? Do you want to be a a more loving parent? Those children just have their way of pushing those buttons and you need the love of God. Begin with the keystone habit of time with God. Is someone at your workplace really getting under your skin and pushing your buttons? Begin with the keystone habit of spending time with God. Do you have an annoying neighbor that is throwing trash over into your lawn? Begin with the keystone habit of time with God. This habit of being filled every day with the Spirit of God will have dramatic implications for every other area of your life. This is the beginning and the ground and the foundation and the ground of where real transformation begins and we must be still and know that he is god there is something about the morning when i was a child one of my most treasured memories is my dad would get out this rubber boat and tie it somehow to the top of our station wagon at 4 a.m. And I would hop in that car with my dad and we would go off to a reservoir on the lake and go fishing. And there's something about those morning hours. Being Alaskans, I know you know. On that water, it is like glass. Right in the morning, just just simply like glass. And I remember wetting the line just 
and the ripples would just shimmer out. And there is something about that time that is so sublime and peaceful before all of the other cares and all the other fishermen and all the other competition and all the other waves come in. It's just you and the, and the great outdoors. Something about it. And in the same way, God invites us in the morning, in the stillness, before all of the clutter and all of the engagements and all of life and just the chaos of, of what 21st century living has become, God invites us to pause in the stillness and be filled. Amen? This is so foundational to our spiritual existence. It's not about once filled, always filled. It is daily filling. Every single day in the stillness, be still and know that He is God. And sometimes I just sit in His presence and I didn't even have the words to speak, but I praise God because the Holy Spirit, according to the Bible, is the translator. Sometimes I'm like, Lord, I don't even know what to say because my heart, I can't articulate. I can't find the words. The Bible tells us the Holy Spirit takes our intentions and translates them for us. And so sometimes I just sit in God's presence and I say, Lord, you know my heart. I'm here. Fill me is my earnest plea. Habits of disengagement. Getting alone with God. Don't misunderstand me. We need community. We need to come together and worship in spirit and in truth and we must spend time alone with God. Intimacy comes through being alone with the individual. And in the inner sanctum of your closet, that space that is between you and God, create that sanctuary to be alone with God. And this is so essential, unplugging. Turn the phone off or to airplane mode or put it in another room. Facebook will be there when you get back to it. Twitter will be too and Instagram or whatever the millennials are going through nowadays. I don't know. But the point is, unplug. Put it in another room and say, Lord, this is my time with you. And what I do sometimes, I have a piece of paper, and as I'm praying, this is what happens, a thought comes in my head, oh, I need to do this, I need to... I write it down, and I say, okay, I'm going to get back to it later. So I just put it down there, and I say, okay, this is my time with you. Quietness, the stillness of the morning, where we can hear God speaking to our hearts. When every other voice is hushed, when every earthly interest is turned aside, the silence of the soul makes more distinct the voice of God. Here, rest is found in Him. The peace, the joy, the life of the soul is God. I was at a seminar and a man was sharing about his wife's spiritual experience. He's a professor. And he says that his wife every night before she goes to bed. She doesn't set her alarm. She prays and says, Lord, when you want to spend time with me, wake me up. You ever tried that? And she's, he said that she wakes up regularly at a consistent time. And I believe, if our eyes could be open, that the angel comes down, wakes her up, and she said, okay, it's my time with you. I believe that when we give him that invitation, he will do it. He will do it. 
Perhaps that's something that we can incorporate into our daily lives. Say, Lord, help me to wake up. When you want to spend time with me, wake me up. Our last quotation, Steps of Christ, page 70. Consecrate yourself to God in the morning. Make this your very first work. Let your prayer be, Take me, O Lord, as wholly thine. I lay all my plans at thy feet. Use me today in thy service. Abide with me and let all my work be wrought in thee. This is a daily matter. Each morning, consecrate yourself to God for that day. Surrender all your plans to Him to be carried out or to be given up as His providence should indicate. Thus, day by day, you, uh, day by day, you shall be giving your life into the hands of God and thus your life will be molded more and more after the life of Christ. How many of you want this? Amen? To be filled, not only once, but to be filled every single day with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit brings with Him the presence of Jesus. Let us pray. Father in Heaven, we thank You that You long to fill us. We thank You that through the Holy Spirit, that the presence of Jesus can not only be with us, but in us. And today we ask for a hungering and thirsting for righteousness. We pray that you would give us a desire to spend quiet time with you, to be filled, not just today, not just once, but to be filled every single day. May your angel wake us in the morning. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You have been listening to another special American Christian Ministries presentation. International copyright, all rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 800-233-4450. International calls now 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministry.org. There you will discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. You can trust ACM. There's no compromise here. If American Christian Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony? We'll share it with the speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He is coming soon.